Point Cloud Workshop for 2021. This week, our very special guest is Dr. Kurosh Klosterham, and uh, Kurosh will be talking about the use of LiDAR in self-driving vehicles and uh, also some um, uh, of the more uh, conventional um, LiDAR applications. Uh, so over to you, Kurosh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I'm not very used to Teams. I'm looking for the button to share my screen. Right. Looks like a little box with an arrow pointing up. The, it's the up there. And then you can select your. Um, then you can select the um, screen. So it's coming. I can see you, there you go. And if you maximize that, that should work. Good on you. Right. Full screen and you're all set. Yep. Thanks, Kuro. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Jack asked me to talk about laser scanning uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, I asked him, uh, do, do you want me to talk about uh, old applications or modern applications? And he said both. So today I've uh, chosen two topics, uh, which is very much related to my interest in laser scanning, but more is one more uh, sort of conventional, appli uh, conventional application, and the other one is more uh, modern. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, heritage building information modeling using laser scanning and then high definition maps, uh, which is one of the requirements for autonomous vehicles that we we'll, hopefully we'll see on the road in the near future. Um, before that, I will uh, give you an overview of laser scanning in general, the, the developments in laser scanning uh, in the past 10, 20 years. Uh, then I talk about HBeam and some of the challenges in um, building modeling of heritage. Uh, and then we move to uh, autonomous driving and the role of LiDAR and or laser scanners for autonomous vehicles. And then at the end, uh, I'll summarize with a few open challenges that I think would define directions for, for future research. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me whenever you have questions. Uh, I, I understand this is a like an informal uh, talk, so Thanks. you can interrupt me. Of course, thank you. Um, yep, so laser scanning, uh, this is uh, what I think some of the developments in laser scanning, not, not focusing on the technology of the laser itself. Um, um, not, for example, including full waveform or multispectral, hyperspectral, um, single photon LiDAR, but more on the platforms that we use for laser scanning and some of the applications of laser scanning. I think that we became interested in laser scanning first time when uh, we learned about airborne laser scanning, putting a, a laser scanner on board an aircraft. And very quickly we learned that uh, it has advantages over photogrammetry. Um, for example, you can easily filter out vegetation and create a nice uh, terrain model, just a bare uh, terrain, which is not as easy to do with photogrammetry. Um, then soon after that, we uh, the, I think terrestrial laser scanners came to um, basically uh, to market and were used for high definition surveys. So uh, surveyors learned that instead of using total stations and measuring one point at a time, you can just put the laser scanner and capture millions of points very accurately. Mobile laser scanning was uh, pretty much the same as airborne laser scanning, the same integration of a laser scanner with a GNSS receiver and uh, initial measurement unit, but then you put it on a vehicle and then we learned that it's a very suitable tool for uh, capturing the road environment and, and creating uh, maps of uh, the, the uh, streets and uh, uh, street furniture, basically traffic objects. Um, so then uh, with mobile laser scanning and airborne laser scanning, there was a gap in, in terms of the scale. So it's uh, mobile laser scanning were limited to street environment. Airborne laser scanning is capturing high data from a um, more or less large distance from the air. And 
Then the idea of UAV borne LiDAR was that if you put a LiDAR scanner, a laser scanner on board uh, a UAV, then you can uh, capture data of a smaller area from, from a closer distance, for example, around a building, a large building or, or a block. The problem with, uh, initially was that uh, laser scanners were heavy and they couldn't be lifted by uh, UAVs at the time. But nowadays we have lightweight laser scanners and UAVs that can carry uh, a bigger load. So um, we see several UAV-borne LiDAR systems currently in the market. The next development was LiDAR SLAM. Uh, one of the limitations of laser scanners uh, on mobile platforms was that you had to uh, integrate it with a GNSS receiver and initial measurement unit, um, which is a problem when you want to scan uh, an enclosed environment, for example, if you go inside a tunnel or under a tree canopy or inside a building in indoor environments because you don't have GNSS reception. Uh, so SLAM solves this problem by using the, the LiDAR data itself by creating a map and uh, estimating the, the position of the sensor within that map, so without needing GNSS. Um, and then we saw in the past five, six years, or maybe even more, a little bit more, um, LiDAR SLAM uh, becoming really mature, and, and now we have commercial sensors that implement this LiDAR SLAM. Uh, and I think then that the, our last uh, interest in laser scanners is for autonomous driving. Uh, the, the, we've learned that by putting a LiDAR sensor on board a vehicle, um, we, we can actually perceive the road environment better, help the uh, automated driving software, but also um, map the road environment, uh, which is another requirement for autonomous driving. So out of these applications, uh, one that is uh, I'm interested in is heritage building information modeling. Um, uh, we've learned that laser scanners are very suitable tools for uh, creating 3D models of buildings in general. But when it comes to heritage buildings, we have a few uh, uh, special challenges. We know that for heritage buildings, a very accurate documentation, digital documentation is important, uh, especially when you want to plan for conservation projects, restoration activities. Um, also, uh, and this is something also we learned, especially during the, the recent pandemic, that you, you cannot sometimes go to uh, heritage buildings, to museums, or, or you know, they're sometimes they're not accessible. But then once you have a digital model, you can put it online and then organize virtual tools, which is very uh, useful. But the, the first requirement for creating uh, a 3D model of heritage buildings is to capture it in 3D uh, very accurately. That's the, the basis for creating 3D models. And laser scanning is a very suitable tool um, for capturing uh, the details of buildings in, in uh, 3D. So this is an example of a UAV-borne LiDAR sensor that's scanning the uh, Royal Exhibition building in Melbourne, one of the heritage, one of the first heritage buildings, I think the, the first heritage building, or maybe the, the only heritage building in Melbourne that's listed on the UNESCO list of heritage. Um, so it's, the UAV platform is very useful here because it allows us to map inaccessible parts of the building. For example, the dome is quite high, it's I think 60 plus meters high, and uh, the roof also not very easy to, to scan. Uh, with a UAV platform, you can easily fly above and, and capture very accurate data. But then when you go inside the building, because for a, uh, an accurate 3D model, we need the exterior and the interior. And when you go inside, then you cannot take the drone inside. Um, firstly, because you don't have GNSS reception and the UAV requires GNSS reception, uh, but also because of safety. I mean, it's a huge uh, quadrocopter, octocopter, 
um, you, you, you don't want to take it inside the heritage building, it's not safe. So the, the sensor that's very common, commonly used for mapping inside heritage buildings is terrestrial laser scanning, terrestrial laser scanner, um, which provides very detailed and accurate data of, of the interior of the building. Uh, but then it's very inefficient. So in this example, in, inside the Royal Exhibition Building, uh, we captured maybe 50, 60 scans, and it took us uh, two or three days, days that we started early morning, like 5 p.m. So that, that's a lot of work, and it, it's very slow. Another option that we tried in the Royal Exhibition Building was using mobile uh, handheld laser scanners, so basically the same LiDAR SLAM technology that I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, because it's based on a SLAM algorithm, it doesn't require GNSS and you can take it with you uh, inside the buildings in the indoor environments. Um, it's very efficient because it's mobile, you can carry it with you in your hand, uh, and it can uh, basically, you can capture inside and outside in one go. You, you don't have to basically separate the exterior and interior, and then because in that case, you will have to register the two scans together. Uh, with a handheld laser scanner like this one, you can start from the exterior, scan the exterior and then go inside and, and scan the interior. The problem, uh, at least for this version of uh, handheld laser scanners, was that it had a limited range, uh, I think 30 meters, and that means uh, you sometimes uh, you, you have uh, a high ceiling, in this case the dome of the building, uh, was not captured in this scan, so that, that, that's a big issue. So if you look at the picture here, you see the dome of the building is missing because it was about 60 meters high and the laser scanner had a range of only 30 meters. So that, that's that's one issue with, with these handheld laser scanners uh, currently. The, the, I think that there might be some longer range versions um, which we didn't have. Um, then the next problem is once you capture the building, um, with the laser scanner, you, you have very accurate and dense and detailed point cloud. Um, but that point cloud is not very useful because you want to create a, a 3D model that's compact and contains uh, other information, for example, semantic attributes that you can attach to building elements. Uh, so there's a modeling step that, that you, you will have to do after uh, collecting raw data. There are two main approaches to 3D modeling. One is parametric modeling, uh, which basically um, it, it consists of putting parametric shapes next to each other and creating the whole building. The other approach is reality-based modeling, uh, where you're basically more dependent on the raw data and you just create surfaces uh, using your raw data. So reality-based modeling, it, uh, as the name implies, is, is more real looking, whereas parametric modeling, uh, it's more geometric and it, it's not real looking. Uh, now, parametric modeling has advantages. Uh, so here you see an example of a parametric model of the Royal Exhibition Building. This is a fly-through of the inside. Um, the parametric models can uh, store a lot of semantic information. So basically every element in a parametric model is a shape with a lot of information that can be attached to it. For example, the, the type of material, the cost of the material, the, the time it was last painted or repaired, or whatever you think can be included in a parametric model. It's basically a BIM, like an IFC uh, format, for example. The problem is the, the low visual fidelity. It, it doesn't look real, so it, it looks nice in, in, the, in the video. It's a nice looking model, but it's not like reality. On the other hand, reality-based modeling is uh, creates a model that looks real. So basically, when you capture a point cloud of the building with a laser scanner, you can create a mesh from the point cloud, 
basically connect the points together and usually these points have color because this is kind of usually integrated with the camera. So you get a mesh, a 3D mesh surface that looks real. It has all the details of the building, um, high visual fidelity, but little semantics. There's no really no semantics. Uh, so you, you, you cannot really attach more information to this mesh representation uh, of the building. And that creates a dilemma for us. Uh, can we have both? Can we have high uh, visual fidelity and rich semantics all together in, in, in one model? Um, so we, we've learned that reality-based models, uh, I mean, starting from the, the old uh, documentation method, which is based on blueprints and you know, paper maps, now we have uh, ways to create 3D models uh, that look real, so the reality-based models. And we also have methods to create parametric models, which can contain a lot of semantics. But then there is a gap here. We, we, we don't really have uh, a model currently that has both of the semantic information and uh, the, the visual accuracy, the geometric accuracy that makes it look real. Um, so one of the solutions for this, and this is one of what one of my PhD students has been doing, Marko Rodanovich, uh, is to uh, basically go around this question and instead of trying to integrate everything in one model to say that we, we want to have high geometric accuracy so that it's real looking but also semantics, uh, why not we just keep these models separate? Because there are also other types of information, you know, there are images, there are just raw point clouds, uh, and why not keep them separate? But then, if we uh, basically register these together so that they are all aligned and into the same coordinate system, uh, then you can interact with with these. So if you store them in the same platform and the same platform, and they are aligned, then you can interact between these layers of information. So you can get semantic contents from the BIM, and then for visualization, you just use the, the mesh uh, surface, which looks real looking. Uh, so that's a very simple idea and very easy to implement. Um, I'm saying easy, but you should ask Mark, or you probably say it's more difficult. Um, but then you can combine different types of data. You can combine point clouds uh, and mesh from photogrammetry, for example, uh, parametric model like IFC, BIM, uh, even panoramic images, you can put them all together in, on one platform, and in this case we used Unity. Um, they need to be all registered together, and that allows interaction uh, between the layers. So for example, you can click on uh, an element in the BIM and then show the point cloud, or you can click on a point in the re uh, reality-based model, the real-looking mesh, and get the beam element behind it, and the, the semantic information of that element. So it's a very useful uh, way to, if you can interact between these layers. And it offers both high geometric accuracy, it looks real, and also rich semantic content, which is stored in the beam. Uh, so this is a, a demo uh, of this integrated heritage building information model. Um, th this is what uh, Marco has created. Um, so what you see here, uh, uh, again, is the Royal Exhibition building. Uh, this is basically the, you see the point cloud and the, the mesh. And the, at the bottom of the screen, you can actually turn different layers on and off. So here you see we turn on the, the BIM model and then, then you can turn on the, the mesh model and the point cloud. And then you can interact between different layers. It's a long video, so I'll probably uh, uh, fast forward. Here you see that we you can select, you can click a point on the mesh and uh, uh, basically get the BIM element behind it and all the semantic information of that beam element here on the left panel uh, will be uh, accessible. I fast forward a little bit. 
Um, another advantage is that you have also the images that were used to, to create this model. Um, and you can retrieve the images uh, because the images are also integrated with the point cloud and the 3D information. You can make measurements, 3D measurements in images that so they're all scaled and 3D. You basically cl click on a point in the image and you get the XYZ of the point cloud behind it. So it's a very useful uh, tool that combines different uh, data and models of heritage buildings and allows you to, to interact with those layers. Um, wait a minute, uh, I have a question, Kurus. I yes, miss sir. somehow, how did you create the BIM model from the point cloud? That's yeah, was it an automatic yeah. procedure or a manual procedure? Manual. manual. So the idea okay. of the, this integration is that instead of trying to automate the BIM modeling step, which is hard and you know, uh, you, you can automate this process, but you will end up with a very low level of detail BIM. Um, we thought that, okay, we don't, we don't really want to do that. We can create a very simple BIM um, manually. So you can just quickly load your point cloud into, for example, Autodesk Revit and create the BIM elements. And that's it, very simple. You don't have to include all the details because the details are already in the mesh or the point cloud. So if you want to see the details, you can just turn on the, the mesh layer and those details are usually for visualization. If you want to yeah. interact with, with the BIM elements, uh, you just need the main elements that, that can be created manually. Mm. But if you want to have more information about specific details on the building, um, so you have to somehow create more detailed BIM model. That's right. And, yeah, okay. In that case, you would either have to spend more time doing it manually or use um, some automa automated... Yeah, uh, scan items. to beam some kind of procedure and after that... Yeah, but in the end, uh, if, I, if I mean, I think currently, I, as far as I know, there are no... There are some automated methods, scan to beam methods, but they, they don't give you very detailed models. Um, I think there is a limit. Even the best algorithms will not give you a real looking uh, beam model. So the beam by definition is a simplified uh, abstract model. It's not real looking. Um, if, if you want to, you, you can of course uh, add texture to every surface of the beam, but then it becomes too heavy and clumsy. And why not keep it in the point cloud or mesh, and then keep the beam simple uh, just for storing the, the, the semantic information. Mm, yeah, but depends again what kind of semantics you want to have. So if it is only about walls and roof and um, some in indoor information, generalized info indoor information, I can imagine that it's going to be enough. Um, to have simplified BIM model, but if you want to, for example, have some additional information about these pillars and type of windows and um, individual doors or some of the uh, ornaments on the dome, then yeah, somehow you have to create them to be able to attach the information. You cannot That's right. stay I mean, in, yeah. The BIM can be detailed. Uh, it, the, the problem is, in the end, it, it will be a beam, it will be a model, it's not going to be useful for visualization. So you, you can add a lot of details that can be useful for different applications. But I think in the end for visualization, if uh, you want to create a virtual tour, for example, uh, I think that the mesh is uh, more attractive because it, it, it's real looking. I think yeah, at the okay. end of the video, yeah. we have also the, so this is the point cloud of the interior. And you said you, you might want to see the details in the dome, for example. So here we have the, the panoramic images of, of the dome. Um, 
But again, so the beam doesn't really have that much detail here, but if you just want to visualize it, you can just look at the images. It, it's better for visualization. And because it's again integrated with the uh, point cloud, you can make measurements in the uh, panoramic images. Yeah, that's lovely. I really like the concept of bringing together the, you know, as you say, the multi layered um, documentation. I mean, such a simple idea, but it's very well executed here. And just the one question I've got is also um, <clears throat> like, um, when you said we can click on something and see its information, are you assuming that's the the closest thing to the the point of view, or uh, you know, is it what what I might call the Z depth? You know, like how how, how do you yeah? You know, because if you click on the screen, that might be penetrating through several layers of things yep. in the BIM. Yeah, is that uh, the scope or? I think it's. Basically, by uh, like a ray tracing, so a ray that that comes from the, the the viewpoints to the point that you click on the screen, and then the in intersection with any elements that you have in in the on the platform in the Unity. Yeah. Um, so the first step is like that, but then Marco will know it more technically correct. <laughs> Can probably give you a more technically correct answer. I think that's probably the easiest way, isn't it? Just to have the, the closest, the, if you can see the thing and you click on it, it's the closest thing to your, you know, ray trace. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. thanks. Cheers. Yeah. All right. Um, yep. Yeah, so this was a bit of a conventional. Uh, application of, uh, of laser scanning, which I, I think is still very useful and, and very interesting. Uh, even though the, the concept of Heritage BIM is uh, relatively new, I think and it, it started maybe in the past uh, five, six years. Um, but the a, a more uh, modern application of laser scanning is for autonomous vehicles and uh, if you have ever Googled autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, you'll probably see these pictures and you might notice that on top of each of these autonomous vehicles from different uh, manufacturers. So this is from like Uber, Lyft, Ford, uh, Google Waymo, Baidu is developing one, even our, our Melbourne Uni autonomous bus. They all have a sensor on the top, uh, which is basically a LiDAR sensor and it serves as the eye of the vehicle. It, it, uh, most of the developers of autonomous driving software have realized that LiDAR is uh, uh, a very suitable sensor for perceiving the road environment and also mapping the environment. Um, it, it has a couple of important advantages uh, over cameras. Uh, for example, it's independent of the ambient light. So if you drive at night, your LiDAR sensor can still capture a very nice 3D uh, data, whereas your camera can only see in front of you if your headlights are on. Uh, also in poor weather conditions, and uh, we've seen some nice data captured in uh, Canada when there is snow or rain or uh, fog, and your camera is basically completely blind. It doesn't really capture anything, but your LiDAR data does capture some information. It is noisy, but still it's far more reliable than the camera. Um, so that, that's the advantage of LiDAR compared to camera. Uh, and the, it has been used for uh, three main purposes uh, for autonomous driving. One is to perceive that the driving scene, to understand where the pedestrians are, where the other vehicles are, and what objects are on the side of the road, for example, traffic related objects. Uh, it's also used for creating high definition maps of road environment and high definition maps are special types of maps that are 3D and contain information uh, related to the traffic and related to driving. And one of the more recent applications of LiDAR sensors is for vehicle positioning. So this is something we've learned recently that 
um, when your GNSS is not working. Of course, there are other solutions for positioning the, the vehicle. For example, when you drive in uh, the Melbourne CBD with a lot of tall buildings, there is no GNSS reception. If you drive inside the tunnel or you go into a, a indoor parking lot, your GNSS is lost and we need an alternative positioning technology. And we've learned that LIDAR provides a, a very attractive uh, uh, solution that can be integrated with GNSS and complements GNSS. And I will show you some of the results uh, on vehicle positioning a little bit later. Um, so this is uh, one example of driving scene perception. Um, uh, this is uh, what one of our students uh, has been doing, uh, uh, session. Uh, so th this, is, this is uh, one of the largest data sets uh, for um, basically driving scene perception. It, it's a new sense data set. And if you look at the, the results that we've obtained, when you use only the images, um, you can achieve an accuracy of 95%, but then, or 97% F1 score. But when you combine images with LiDAR data, then your accuracy increases to 99%. And this is most of the, the data is captured at daytime and, and good weather conditions. But then you see here at night, when you drive at night, um, sometimes you see objects here that are really uh, not visible in the camera, but your LiDAR can pick up those objects and this is why the integration of LiDAR with uh, camera is very useful for driving scene perception. The other use of uh, laser scanners uh, on board vehicles is for creating high definition maps. Um, I think the term of uh, the high definition was first uh, used in uh, 2013 by um, the company here, Maps. Um, which was basically contracted by Mercedes-Benz to develop HD maps. And um, they, for the first time, they, they did a demonstration of their intelligent drive system, uh, which was using a detailed map, uh, which they called HD map, high definition maps. Uh, so basically a high definition map, uh, it has three layers of information. One is a road model, the road boundaries, one is a lane model, the location of the lane markings, and then landmarks and uh, other objects around the, the road environment and traffic related objects. Um, the, the representation of a HD map is uh, a big question currently. We don't really know what, what's the standard format, so different companies are working on different formats, but the most common one is, is an object-based format or a vector model. So basically you have the roads, boundaries, and the, the, the lanes and the objects represented by vectors. Um, but you can also use the raw point cloud as uh, a map because it, it does basically represent the road environment. If you have a labeled point cloud, if you classify your point cloud and uh, you basically have objects in the point cloud so that could be used as, as a HD map. And there's also the boxer representation, um, where you basically um, uh, represent the road environment by uh, a regular grid of 3D voxels. There's also a serifal, but serifal is less common. So serifal is basically a, a mesh that can be um, basically made denser and denser when you have more and more data. But for any of these representations, create these, the more the main data source is a point cloud that's captured by a laser scanner, sometimes combined with RGB from a camera. So these are the three representations for high definition maps. Uh, the label point cloud is, uh, you, you can basically create this automatically. Uh, nowadays you can classify point clouds with a, a relatively high accuracy. Uh, but then the problem is you only have the points, 3D coordinates and a label, and that's all. There's not much semantic information that you can store in a point cloud. The bigger problem is that uh, the point clouds are very large. So imagine that you want to um, maintain 
large point clouds of the whole city. And uh, especially if we use vehicles in a crowdsourcing approach to create the map, all vehicles that drive on the roads, then you will have a huge amount of data that you need to manage. Um, voxel maps, uh, and it's sometimes we call it Minecraft model, and uh, that, that picture Sorry, is from this picture, right? Of, Sorry, I stole this picture from, from your presentation. No, 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 thank you very much. Um, greatly putting the image credit on there. However, I've got to say, uh, Midco made the image. <laughs> um, so I'll if, have if, to update the, the credit. It's, 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 yeah, yeah. it's the first time I've ever been able to um, not only see um, a, a credit for myself, but to actually have the other person on the same conference. So <laughs> if, if, um, if Midco Al Alexandra, uh, he, he deserves a fair credit. But thank you very much. It's great to see that image um, poking its head up and. Um, um, and and in, in, in very well placed in between the uh, the point cloud and the object based models. So um, yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Please uh, carry on. I think, but it, it's it, not uh, just another correction. It's not really Minecraft model, uh, Kuros. Huh? Um, the voxel map that you have. It's Unity. Yeah. It's you have written there that it's Minecraft model, but it's not. So my, I thought Minecraft is using voxels as well, no? It is. Yeah, we, we it's using it instead. What's the difference then? Um, we didn't use Minecraft. Midco used Unity to make the voxels. I know. So, it's, I don't mean that it's created in Minecraft. But yeah, it's, I think it's just Minecraft a name. It's a name that people are more yeah. familiar with. This is what we say all the time. It's like Minecraft. It, 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 yeah. It's it's not exactly Minecraft, but it, it, it's like because everyone knows what Minecraft is. We can say voxels are what you see in Minecraft, but you know they're not yeah. not proprietary yeah. to. Yeah, that's what I mean here. It's uh, it's in this particular case only the trees were uh, voxelized, uh, but yes, it is my Minecraft uh, based. Uh -huh. or, it's it's all happening at once. The baby's crying, and everything. <laughs> We're getting the the, the most uh, a really good discussion um, uh, actually with everyone. <laughs> this has been the most engaged um, talk, I think, actually, Cora. So, thanks. Uh, keep yes. keep keep <laughs> continue, please. Um, yeah, but I, I think that this uh, voxel representation is going to be quite popular in the near future because the, it has a very big advantage and it's you can actually use it in, in a crowdsourcing approach for uh, creating the HD map. So it, 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 you can have every vehicle that's basically driving on the road with a LiDAR sensor will yeah. map the road environment anyway. This LiDAR sensor will be basically on uh, and sensing the road environment. And if you can basically uh, send your scans to, uh, let's say, a, a central server and create these voxels in, in real time. Uh, in robotics, we have the, the concept of uh, occupancy grid, uh, which is essentially a voxel representation. But then you, you don't keep your point clouds. You basically feed your point clouds into this occupancy grid, uh, which is a voxel representation and update your 3D cells in the occupancy grid, which has a fixed size. It doesn't grow, it, it, it's a fixed size. And then you, uh, with more data, you just have more confidence about uh, a voxel, whether it's occupied or whether what kind of object that is. So I think it is uh, voxel representation and occupancy grid would be the future of uh, high definition maps. Um, and it's also, it can be accessed very quickly, uh, uh, especially imagine that you're driving and you don't want to uh, download the HD map of a whole city to your vehicle. You only want the part that's relevant for you. So maybe with a radius of, I don't know, uh, 200 meters or 500 meters around your vehicle. And that can be done very quickly when you have a voxel representation because basically every voxel has XYZ coordinates. Um, so these are the advantages of uh, voxel map. The other uh, type of high, high definition maps or the other format is object base or, or a vector representation. Some people call it landmark model. 
And this seems to be the, the way currently companies are doing, even though we don't really know much, but I know here maps and a few other companies are working on creating HD maps, but they seem to be taking this format where you have basically all traffic related objects uh, modeled by, as, as a vector. The problem with this approach is that you have to create it manually. Uh, there's no automatic way as far as I know to, co to create this uh, representation automatically. The advantage is that it's very lightweight and it can include a lot of semantic information that's useful for uh, driving. Uh, vehicle positioning is another application of lazy scanners on board vehicles. Um, uh, there are two ways uh, or three ways you can do positioning using a laser scanner, especially when you don't have GNSS reception. Uh, one is called LiDAR odometry, uh, where you basically stitch your consecutive scans. So the laser scanners, usually they have a frequency of 20 to 30 scans per second, the ones that are used in automotive industry at least. So in every second you capture 20 or 30 scans, and you can basically stitch these together, you can register them. So here in this figure, you see that the blue scan and the green scan at two different times. And by registering these two scans, uh, you basically estimate the motion of the vehicle. So if you start from an initial known position, you can do positioning using uh, the laser scanner and LiDAR odometry. It can be done in real time. The problem is drift. Um, because you're doing the, this local motion estimation, basically uh, positioning with respect to a previous uh, scan, then you have drift. That means your errors accumulate and after some time your trajectory uh, becomes inaccurate. Uh, to get rid of the drift, a better approach is to register your current scan from the vehicle. We call it a rover scan, like the blue one here. Register that one with a reference scan that's already georeferenced, and it can be a layer in your high definition map. Um, so, as I said, point cloud, is, point cloud is also a format for the high definition map. So, imagine that you have a, a set of georeferenced uh, laser scans of the road environment that serve as your HD map, and then you can register your uh, rover scans from the vehicle with that map. And by registering, you can uh, estimate the position of the vehicle with respect to the map without any drift. Uh, this has the, the, the problem that sometimes your map is not up to date. So there might be changes in the environment that's not reflected in the map. So this registration uh, sometimes might fail, and that means you cannot do positioning. So, a third approach is to combine these two. So you can do LiDAR odometry, and then from time to time, you can register your rover scan to the reference scan, and then you will have uh, a very reliable um, positioning solution for the vehicle. All right, so I think that these two are very interesting directions for uh, laser scanning. Uh, lots of room for research. Um, but some of these that I think are, are quite interesting and, and require more research, some of the challenges. One is the automated scan to beam that Sissi mentioned earlier. Uh, even though I think we need to keep beam simple um, and so that we can generate it quickly, uh, it would be good if we can do this automatically. And so there is a uh, uh, scan to beam is basically um, automated algorithms but algorithms that can do this automatically um, take a point cloud and generate a simple model automatically um, this is still not possible it's the, the current uh, methods are still uh, involve a lot of manual uh, interaction so it's not fully automatic um, the other challenge is scene understanding from point clouds and that also relates to uh, scan to beam. If you can understand, if the machine can understand the point cloud and be able to detect different types of objects, and then it, it can create a model out of it. Um, so 
The problem with semantic expanding is that uh, the, the current methods are basically machine learning, uh, and they all supervise machine learning. Supervised machine learning requires examples, requires training data. Uh, with point clouds, we don't have much training data. Even if you look at the largest data sets available currently, there's not much uh, examples in there's not much labeled data. Um, and even if there is, you, you want to uh, Basically, for example, on a vehicle, uh, let's say Google develops a machine learning model that can take a point cloud and understand the objects that are in it. And then you take this model and put it on a vehicle and then export this vehicle to Australia. The first time this vehicle, the LiDAR sees, or the, the camera sees a kangaroo sign, you know, these road signs that the kangaroo is passing. I'm sure nobody has seen that in California. They don't have it. So that, that's, that's an issue that the, the algorithms are scene dependent and if they are trained in a certain geographical location, they are trained for that location. When you deploy them in a new environment, they will have problems. Um, so I think these are some of the challenges uh, in uh, basically working with laser scanners. Uh, and I think one future direction for research is unsupervised machine learning um, to develop methods that can learn uh, from the data itself or, or from other types of examples rather than real examples. So, for example, uh, using synthetic data or by uh, learning to reconstruct. Uh, the input, for example, so these are uh, different types of unsupervised learning. Um, I think uh, this, this will be uh, very useful for uh, better applications of laser scanning. Also, incremental learning, uh, all these machine learning methods that we develop based on some examples, when they are deployed uh, into, in, a, in a new environment or when they are applied to a new set of data, they will struggle uh, because there are things that they haven't seen before, they are not trained for. So incremental learning is that these models should be able to learn incrementally as, as they uh, are being used and as they see new objects and new scenes, new data, uh, they can learn more and more and become better and better. I, I guess that's the real argument for um, keeping this data open and shared. R because, you know, if you were to I guess if you know a lot of the companies that would be using this are so large scale, you'd maybe have a, a situation where you know they're keeping them as walled gardens, doing their own internal analysis, and then just releasing it as a a product. But it, it'd be great to to see this as a some resource that that you know is, is more of an open street map model than um, the yeah. Google Street View model, you know. So that, that's one issue that uh, data, current data are not open, uh, they're not available to public. But the other issue is um, you, you want annotated data. It's not just uh, enough to share the, the LiDAR scans. The raw. Need to be annotated. Yeah. So, and that's, that's another challenge because it's not easy to annotate point clouds. In images, it's, it's much easier and just draw a rectangle and say this is a person, that's a car. Uh, in point clouds, it's uh, harder and because it's 3D and also it's set of points and people are not really used to point clouds. Um, I think unsupervised machine learning has a huge potential because uh, also for images, because you can learn, you don't have to just learn from examples provided by a human. You can learn from, for example, a 3D model, or you can learn from uh, synthetic samples. Uh, th uh, th these are areas that are less explored in, in machine learning, and I think that there's a lot of room for uh, exploration. Yeah, sure. I have some examples. Yes, go, to, go ahead, Jack. You wanted to ask something? No, oh, no, this is this is really good. <laughs> yeah, so some examples, uh, and, and this is uh, basically just a very preliminary 
uh, results that we have. Um, the, the question here was whether we can generate synthetic samples from a mobile uh, LiDAR data set. So, you know, in a, if you capture a mobile LiDAR uh, uh, laser scanner data set uh, from a mobile platform, uh, you see all the objects within the road environment. Uh, but then when you want to classify, one of the problems I've seen in, is that uh, even if you have a data set covering kilometers of road environments, when you want to uh, find, uh, for example, traffic signs, uh, there's not many uh, traffic signs or, I don't know, traffic lights, just a few. Uh, so that's a problem because you, you, you can annotate this, but you don't have enough training samples to be able to train a model and classify other point clouds. So one of the things we wanted to explore is whether we could generate synthetic samples uh, and by, based on basically real samples. So this is an example, a, a network that we've developed um, with, with one of my students, uh, Sagar. Uh, we basically generate uh, samples. So we use an encoder-decoder network. It takes a real sample that we take from a point cloud, we feed it, and this network learns to reconstruct this, um, just a, an, an exact replica of the real sample. Now, of course, it's not going to be exactly like the input, but th this network actually does a decent job. It can reconstruct this, but then it's not synthetic. So what we do is that we, when we uh, create, uh, we take a lot of samples, uh, examples of a certain object, and then in the middle, you will have a distribution of the features and then you can sample from that distribution. So what, what, once you take a random sample, then you can generate, you can reconstruct a synthetic object that's not going to be an exact replica of your real objects, but it will have the same features because it comes from the same distribution. And then uh, you, you can combine this with a, a discriminator that you can also train this discriminator to distinguish between real samples and synthetic samples. And the purpose of this is that to force this network to generate more real looking samples so that this part of the network is fooled and they cannot, it, it cannot distinguish between the real and synthetic ones because the synthetic ones are so real looking that, uh, that can be, cannot be distinguished. So once we train this network, it's very interesting uh, that we can generate objects like these that actually look uh, like the real object. So this is a real LiDAR sample, it's a traffic sign, and these are the synthetic examples. Uh, they're pretty, pretty much the same shape, at least, uh, uh, is, is you can see in the synthetic samples. Now, once you uh, use these samples to classify a point cloud, to train a classify and classify the point cloud, we observed a huge improvement. So this is on the left, a model that was trained only by real samples, and it, it can achieve uh, F1 measure 85%, 81, 86%. And then when we add synthetic samples as additional samples, then the F1 score uh, really increases to 94% and even 100% for traffic signs and, and traffic uh, uh, lights. So that shows the potential of uh, synthetic samples for uh, machine learning. Uh, another thing that uh, we wanted to explore was scene adaptation. Um, and this is the, the work of Hai Feng Lu that was visiting me last year. So the idea here is that you have a machine learning model that can classify LiDAR point clouds of a certain environment. So it knows, for example, that's a building in the point cloud. But then you drive in a new environment, a different scene, you still see buildings, but the buildings look different. So for example, if you drive in the Netherlands, you'll see these uh, small one-story houses, but then suddenly you, you, you take your vehicle and drive in Shanghai, and then you see all these high-rise buildings. Uh, obviously, your machine learning model is not able to classify these as buildings because the buildings it has seen they look different, they are uh, smaller and shorter. So how can we um, do scene adaptation to, to train the network that these are still the same buildings? 
Uh, the buildings look different because the data looks different, but also the features. So when you feed these to a uh, say semantic segmentation network or classification network, the features of these buildings and these buildings are different. So what we've tried here is um, one uh, basically data alignment step before the feature extraction and then one feature alignment step after the feature extraction. So all we would try to do is look at the distribution of, uh, for example, building features in the original scene and the distribution of building features in our new scene and then try to align these two distributions by minimizing uh, uh, basically the adversarial loss. Um, so this also gave very interesting results. So when we, we, we can actually try this with, with any backbone network, uh, with PointNet or I don't know, uh, DGCNN, any, any classification network, you can just add this plugin and then it will do the scene adaptation and it can really improve the, the accuracy of classification. So here you see, for example, the accuracy is going from 80 something percent to 95 percent, which is uh, a very uh, uh, considerable improvement in, in the accuracy. All right, uh, I, I think I've talked enough. Uh, just to summarize uh, with a few conclusions, I think laser scanning is a very useful and powerful technology with lots of applications and we see every day a new application for laser scanning. Uh, Heritage Beam is probably one of the con conventional applications of laser scanning, uh, but there are still challenges. So one is the scanning challenge. Uh, how do you scan the exterior and the interior and you know inaccessible parts all together so if you have a complete data set. Um, it's not easy. You might have to use different sensors and then register all these together. Um, it's still mainly manual. Then there is the dilemma of semantic richness and visual fidelity. Um, and I think this integrated heritage beam is, is a nice solution because you can combine different types of models into one platform. Uh, HD maps, high definition maps. Uh, the one question here again is what is a suitable format? Um, it, currently, most companies are working on object based models. Uh, in academia, if you look at public data sets, for example, people use for research, they all use point clouds, so the raw point cloud. But I think the one in the middle, the voxel map, is the, the answer. Uh, I know some startups in the US were developing this uh, voxel map, but I don't know if they've really um, done something really practical or not yet. Um, yeah, it's great to see, 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 um, see that popping up a bit more, and we'd be very, very keen to uh, collaborate on that in, in future in detail. That's, uh, yeah, and it's a lot of fun with fossils. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in, in future, unsupervised machine learning, uh, using synthetic data for machine learning, and also incremental learning. I think if, in general, I think the uh, our best shot to developing intelligent algorithms for processing laser scanner data point clouds is machine learning uh, and the, to overcome these challenges in machine learning applied to point clouds i think we should look into unsupervised methods and, and use of synthetic data and incremental learning uh, just to acknowledge uh, some of the results I've shown in my presentation, these are the works of my students, Marko Radanovic, Haifeng Lu, uh, Session Huang, and Saka Chitnis. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, if there's any question, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, are you okay to, to hang around for a bit bit longer as we, we, we talk? Uh, are are sure. you? Oh, great, yeah. great. Well, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation, Kurosh, and, and um, a great way to to end the year with um, uh, as a, a uh, final uh, presentation in our workshop series. So thank you very much. Very stimulating. Um, my but, uh, yeah, so so many uh, things to talk about there. Um, I think the main um, the main thing I'm thinking about is is that this is such a powerful concept. Of course, it's it's very. Um, rich for commercialization and for you know um, having the big 
big companies buy into it and develop it for their own technologies which, to make them better, to be able to develop better products to an end consumer. But the, the, the thing I'm really sort of uh, wanting to, you know, see, work out the, the next steps with is, is the um, capacity for this to, for open data. So when you've got a, if you've got a LiDAR scanner in a car, that implies that it's going to be a proprietary scanner, you know, it'll be part of that product. Maybe if we had a, like to use the analogy of, of OpenStreetMap, or maybe OpenStreetMap will evolve into this, but do, I mean, maybe, is, is, do you think it would, there would, um, how do you think that? that making that data open is not easy, it's not maybe feasible. So, you, you know, the, the CCTV camera, for example. Um, or, or imagine a dash camera you have on, on your on your car. Um, it it only stores uh, the footage of say the last four or five days, because more than that, it would be such a big data that it's, it's not really doesn't make sense to to store it and keep it, and make it open. And I think it's the same with with lidar data. If you have a vehicle with a lidar sensor and you drive just driving for five hours. Um, you will capture a huge amount of data, which is not easy to store and then make it open. The, the, the right way is to process this data in real time, extract the useful information. If you want to use, extract, for example, the position of the vehicle, or um, if you detect objects in the road environment and send these little packets of data to, to some central map, and then throw away the, the rest of your scan because it's just not practical to, to store that data and make it open. Um, that's why I think that the, this concept of voxels for HD map is very attractive because uh, right. you, you basically feed this data that's coming, that, that's captured by your laser scanner, you, you update the voxel map and you throw away the, the, the laser scanner data. Uh, so the voxel map has the same size, it doesn't increase in size, you just update the information within each voxel. Of course, you know? yeah, yeah. And the, uh, so that I think that's one issue why we don't see, uh, you know, open uh, LiDAR data sets from vehicles at least. Um, but having said that, if, if you look at, for example, new scenes, uh, it or, or Kaiti data set, these are some benchmark data sets. They do have a lot of LiDAR scans, so in the order of like thousands of scans of road environments. But then again, these are just for research and these are like one, um, you know, uh, one vehicle just driving in the roads and capturing data for this purpose of, you know, research and experimentation. Um, but yeah, I think it, have, it Having, for example, a company like Google Waymo, for example, creating an open data set of all the scans that captured by the vehicle, no, I think that's no, not really practical. Ne never, yeah, it's it's yeah, not going to happen. So, yeah, that definitely that's where the voxel space is is um, has a real impact. Yeah, um, Kurosh, could I just ask you to uh, stop sharing your screen so um, yep. we can see the the other uh, guests? Yeah. Cheers, thanks. Uh, Mitko uh, has arrived. A wild Mitko has appeared. Oh, I, I'm here. Yeah. Hi, Kurosh. How are you? Hi, Mitko. I'm Hi, in Melbourne. Oh, Melbourne is cold and wet. <laughs> yeah, not really similar to here now. Yeah, it is very nice to, to see uh, all the work that you're doing with the students. Uh, it is very similar to what we are doing. <laughs> here uh, and I have a few questions for more or less each of the sections that you covered today uh, for the first part because uh, uh, I'm using unity for three four years and uh, I managed to visualize mesh models point clouds and so on I have a question I mean uh, have you thought to use uh, voxels to kind of uh, merge those two like beam models or to see the the differences between the point clouds and the beam models, uh, 
because uh, I think there will be some differences and you don't see them. Yep. Uh, no, at the, at the moment, uh, I think, so, you know, in my team, Marco is using Unity um, for this heritage model and uh, I think so far he has point clouds and mesh and uh, IFC that, that uh, is now in, in integrated in, in the Unity platform. But I think it, if, if you want to include voxels, that shouldn't be a problem because, uh, you know, Unity, you, you, it's you have those assets that are graphic objects. So if you take, create a model with, uh, say, those cube assets, um, should be easy to, to visualize it. No, I mean, it's not just about visualizing, but also to, to voxelize the BIM models, to voxelize the point clouds and see the differences uh, in terms of, I think there will be some uh, mismatch in some places. Uh, it depends also on the size of the voxel that you would consider. Also, yeah. I think uh, uh, I saw that the video is a bit lagging because uh, when you try to visualize uh, a lot of point clouds, uh, there are some assets that allow to visualize many millions in Unity, but still not like billions or what, a bit more. And I think yeah. uh, using voxels, uh, uh, because uh, I have created in Unity a voxelizer for like beam models, uh, mesh models, point clouds, I have these things, and we can easily understand the differences. Uh, and also just visualize voxels, and there, there can be a really lightweight, uh, the visualization can be way more smoother, I mean, compared to visualizing point clouds or beam models, they can be heavy. That's very good. We should, we should uh, talk more later. Maybe uh, yeah. we can do <laughs> something yeah. together. Definitely. The second thing uh, was about, yeah, I, I remember that article uh, from here map about HD uh, maps. Uh, I remember this. And using voxels, it can be interesting indeed uh, to see, uh, to update uh, them from time to time. Uh, and the third part, I don't have actually a question for that part, but for the third part, because we had a project and uh, uh, related to uh, people detection uh, using uh, point clouds, uh, and uh, we went to, to a part uh, to, uh, to create synthetic data, and I, I created in Unity the way to collect uh, synthetically from simulations uh, points of people. Uh, but we haven't had time really to, uh, I'm busy with some other projects, to do it uh, properly and combine uh, data from uh, other sources. There are some data, I'm not sure if you are familiar, but there is a one data set huge uh, created by uh, Karlsruhe University, and there are some other. KIT data set, you mean? Uh, Kitty, yeah, KIT, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, but we uh, we managed to generate from uh, Karlsruhe University, Kuroch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if for pedestrians, if, if you want to detect them in point clouds or images, in point clouds, point clouds, because there yeah. is the the dataset uh, MS Coco. I don't know if they have point clouds or not, but they have lots of images with pedestrians annotated in it. Yeah. Uh, there, there are some. There, it's not just the kitty data set. Uh, there are some, definitely. And you mentioned the accuracy, uh, like you mentioned, like 90 something percent. This it depends uh, on, on the on what you measure ex exactly. If you, for example, uh, if you measure the rotation as well uh, of the cars and uh, like the, the direction. Uh, it is a bit lower, uh, and if you consider this for pedestrians, it can go to 50-60% to, to, to see and understand the direction of pedestrians in point clouds, because you have even uh, fewer points compared to for cars. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this but is it's interesting. detection accuracy? Yeah. Because you actually, it depends what you are measuring uh, as accuracy. Is it just the position that you are kind of trying to figure out if you are matching it 
to the uh, so the, the, the slides that I showed, it's a semantic segmentation. So accuracy yeah. is the, the number of points that you detect as a pedestrian point yeah. to the ground truth. Yeah. In our case, we were detecting boxes, uh, and we, we, were, we were interested in boxes and also the rotation of those boxes to understand the, the direction of the of movement. More challenging. Yeah, it is, and the accuracy is usually lower. But we were thinking that with synthetic data, maybe we, we could generate quickly synthetic data. Uh, like in one hour, we could mention the whole kitty data set. Uh, that, and it, indeed, what you mentioned is Definitely true. In many cases, you have only uh, a few traffic lights or something. Uh, uh, you can you don't have enough specific elements uh, to to learn from them. Yeah, and uh, I totally agree to use unsupervised or reinforcement learning to uh, to really uh, learn more useful features than uh, just to to concentrate on specific scene or yeah. I think it's very interesting that you are doing this. Yeah, things. absolutely. We should. Uh, I, I also agree. I think that these are very interesting problems. Uh, so, yeah, I'm yeah, happy to uh, discuss further, maybe later at some point. That would be nice. Thank you, Gaurav. Absolutely. There's also the, a. Um, would you say there's a big need for the you know, global. Um, through, well, what are, they, what, what are they called? Global three-dimensional coordinate systems, you know, like the uh, volumetric... Um, occupancy grid? The what, sorry? The, the occupancy uh, grid? No, the... What, what's it called? Um, Sissy, who we... Um, the, the guy that we met with in Canberra, um, where you've got the, like, um, rather than just the two-dimensional um, projections you've have the three dimensional um, wedges that that define the the vertical space as well. It's so like a planetary. A, it, what are they called? Global global grids. Ah, you mean uh, global discrete grid, discrete yeah. global grid system. Matt Purse. Matthew Purse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard about that? That the discrete global grid, Kurosh? No. Neon. Okay, so imagine imagine the way we use raster data in in GIS, yeah, and then bring in the Z. So rather than just having Z as a height or attribute, we bring in Z as part of the coordinate system, yeah. and then you've got the octree, and you can divide that down. That's what th they're talking about there. So you so if you had a, and this is where voxels meet, you know, global raster. So, and you can see the complexity in it, <laughs> and 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 uh, the the. However, having what 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 you're describing is a like a global standard for, you know, something like a, a voxel grid that could harness information in a, a globally standardized way. You know, there's there's. Uh, uh, this is um, exactly global. Digital discrete systems. So this is we yeah, are exactly related to creating a 3D um, virtual grid for the whole Earth. Oh, and then at the moment, um, quite few discussions about it. There is a OGC working group on it, and there are two uh, general ideas: either the global grids on the um, earth level start to be created from meridians and parallels but then you can imagine when you go to a very small grid a very fine grid you get exactly some kind of trapezoid not really cube yeah, yeah. and there is another approach that says okay you continue ex extending the cubes integrating 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 the cubes could be on the basis uh, of the octree. Uh, but then when the curvature start matters, um, what, what are you planning to do with these uh, cubes? In a way, there are going to be some holes between um, the different cells when you 
come up with kilometer by kilometer grid. So um, ODC now is um, considering having the meridian in parallel. So starting from um, this subdivision and going deeper to higher resolution. And as I said, there are some people that are considering a different approach that you try to keep the rectangular cells, although you uh, go for a very large size uh, pixels. So that's um, indeed a very interesting uh, yeah, it might approach. Be also something for the HD maps as well. Mm. And there are a group in uh, Peking University working already for many years on these uh, uh, digital grids. Um, uh, actually, they are even trying to link um, this three-dimensional subdivision and use it uh, to the Baidu system, positioning system, and use it for localization. They even uh, have a very complicated, very long uh, code uh, to um, index all these cubes. So starting from a very large size, I already forgot how, but how much it was, something like kilometers. And after that, going to a centimeter level and you get some mixture of numbers and ciphers, um, something like 12 um, numbers, but then you get the whole space subdivided. And they have some experiments and some implementations for navigation of uh, aircrafts and linking to the um, uh, global positioning system, uh, specifically Baidu. Interesting. I yes. have found the, the OGC page on this this quick. Do you find the OGC page? It, yep, I'll, I'll have a look. Yeah. Yeah, it gets it gets <laughs> mind boggling very quickly, but you can see the concepts very useful, especially if you're looking at something like autonomous vehicles, where you need something that's globally consistent and exactly as you're talking about, but you know where you can have a a, a, a consistent foundation then you know that the, that can then pick up anomalies from that you you, you and to register that to a consistent um space you know a three-dimensional point yeah. oh yeah. yeah and actually yeah this matthew matt Percy is exactly from australia and yeah, he's with you sciences uh, also <laughs> Geoscience Australia and uh, yeah, he's co-chair of the group. Uh, actually, discrete uh, global grid systems, yeah. DGGS. But the, the primary application for this is like uh, as a geographic model or for geosciences? Uh, for um, all kind of applications that are working with uh, large cells, it could be for climatology, it could be for geology, for marine application, uh, meteorological it's exactly applications. Thing. It's exactly the same thing as what happens in when you're working in the, the CAD or BIM world and you've got local coordinate systems where everything's assuming Cartesian grid, you know, the, the grid just is parallel to infinity. With these, you know, it's the same thing when you start to work with GIS, is that the coordinate systems, you know, recognize the spherical, um, you know, datum. So the it's a, it's the same way that raster becomes a, a voxel, you know, uh, a geo, geo raster becomes a DGGS. And you know how much, you know, complex science, well, Sissy just waved her hand, but I mean, maybe I oversimplified it, <laughs> but, but um, you know, the, the, you can imagine the amount of engineering and yeah. work that has to go into coming up with these coordinate systems. So, yeah, it's it's complex and unresolved, you know, so that that's where, you know, we've got to, at least we've got a working group for it, so, yeah. Yeah. But you know, yeah, the, this is uh, quite interesting um, with these global uh, grid systems. Um, we're 
trying actually, I want trying somehow to link uh, the voxels to these global grid systems, but okay, on a high resolution level, it works fine, but after that, it goes a little bit out of hand, so it's not clear how to continue further integrating the cells. So we haven't gone done much about it, although there was an idea actually with Ben try to provide um, any index voxels according to the Peking voxel scheme. But again, it came to these different geometries, let's say geometries, but the different um, cell different grid that you get on a 10 centimeter resolution. Is there any way to compress the, the voxels? So it, it, are you using uh, oak trees, for example? Yeah, or well, Abdu, what do you think? Abdu, Mitku should say what. <laughs> and Abdu, what do you, what oh, do you Mitku is using at the moment. Of course, we are yeah, using yeah, also yes. oak trees. But um, in a way, uh, we even don't have that large data sets at the moment. OK, Matku, you can say how you are using the voxels at the moment. Definitely. Without talk trees, you cannot do much. Uh, it, it gets very heavy if you use arrays or uh, other approaches. But uh, we, uh, we recently Publish, or at least it's still not available, but we, we published a paper in sensors about voxels and voxelizations and data structures. I can send it to you in the next few days. I guess it will be available. Uh, and the thing is, there are many data structures. It depends what you want to do. Uh, Oak trees are the best uh, for storage and visualization. But if you want to do some uh, mathematical operations, uh, uh, random access of voxels, there are some other better approaches, simulations, or if the data structure is changing for some dynamic uh, approaches. But definitely, yeah, oak trees are interesting for storage, and it, it can really reduce the amount of data compared to even meshes, point clouds, uh, significantly. Yeah, for example, uh, uh, Occupancy grids, because th this has been used a lot in computer vision and robotics when you, when you have sensors that move and collect data and you want to store the data. They, they use OctoMap, which yeah. is uh, the basically is uh, Octree version of the occupancy grid and the occupancy grid is basically a voxel representation. Yeah. I, I guess it, for the whole world. It's really small, so when we, we tried it with the KIT dataset, for example, if you look at the, the size of all the laser scans in the KIT dataset, it's huge. But when you uh, uh, basically combine all of these in an octomap, it becomes a very lightweight uh, data structure. It's very small. Yes, yes. But you're right, I agree. Yeah. Yes, if you want to then do something with that octo map, then it's challenging uh, sometimes. It's good only for visualization. Uh, by the way, Kuros, uh, we are just setting up, we set it up already, a uh, special issue on voxel based modeling. I put the link in the chat. So if you are considering something on voxels, on these discrete global grids, or um, something that is um, in this area. Yeah, please consider the, the special issue. We want to really kind of combine research from different um, parts of the world and um, yeah, also somehow get aware of what is going on in the voxel domain, specifically for uh, um, do special applications. So, yeah. uh, as you see, exactly this person, Professor Ren from Peking University. Um, yeah, uh, Stila is also involved, but he suggested to have one of his uh, employees, Yusheng Su. She, he is very good. 
um, and we have people from yeah from United States. So the the idea is to attract from all parts of the world something on voxels. So please consider it. I'm still sending to people. I haven't have the time to announce it very properly, but please right. have it in mind. We're diving pretty deep. I mean, this is uh, right on the uh, the cutting edge of you know voxel technology and <laughs> whatever. So, and, and so is, has anyone else got any um, questions? Um, just to lighten it up a bit, do, does anyone want to talk about uh, autonomous vehicles or uh, heritage? Yes, uh, I hey. do. Uh, I have a question mostly in uh, the heritage part. And you mentioned that, of course, you made a lot of scans, you use a lot of technologies. But the, but the questions that uh, put something in my head is, uh, how many? Well, it's not how many scans do you need, but when do you consider, or if you have a, I don't know, like a line that you should address. Uh, how many scans? How many density? How many? How dense? Do you have some idea in terms of heritage? That that's what yeah. I mean. So you, you know what we did uh, was we had a. Uh, a map, a floor plan of the building, okay. and then we planned where we want to scan on the map. So we put like a, we we planned like we put the scanner here and then there and then there. And if you can, uh, if, so if that building was not very complex inside, it did have a lot of columns, but then the rest was uh, relatively simple. And then you can see uh, if you have a complete. Uh, you will have a complete data set because you, you, with the terrestrial laser scan, you will have lots of gaps behind objects of illusion. So that that's the planning, um, and I've seen that there are also automatic uh, optimization methods for planning the position or placement of laser scanners. Uh, Lucia in. Uh, um, Vigo, University of Vigo, she's been doing some work on that. Uh, so that's for the placement in terms of density. Um, you know, what, what my experience is people who are in charge of heritage buildings, they don't really know about the density or point clouds. Um, it's, it's up to you how much time you have to spend. And in our case, uh, we quickly learned that if you put the laser scanner on the highest density first, it takes uh, like two hours per scan or one hour. And also each scan becomes uh, like gigabytes of data. It's just not manageable. So we used uh, like an average resolution that we were using a far laser scanner. I think we used uh, every point cloud in the end, every scan was something like a a few hundred megabytes, and it took 20 minutes per scan. Um, and that was still a lot of work because uh, we, we captured like 50, 60 scans, each taking 20 minutes. Um, do the math, it takes a lot of time. But uh, even with that uh, average resolution, the point clouds were really nice and they, they were quite dense. Uh, after I registered them together for visualization, we still had to down sample uh, because the, it was really big. Um, so to, for visualization, you, you, we still had to down sample it to a, a smaller point cloud for visualization. Okay, okay, thanks. So more practical considerations. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, because if, if for some reason some uh, agency wants to create this uh, inventory of um, cultural and heritage places, of course they they should uh, publish some kind of uh, requirements, and that that's that's what I'm kind of uh, heading. Okay, 
if some requirements are need to be written, okay, at least have some reference, some uh, ideas, some previous uh, work. So that, that's that's where I'm looking for. But that that's that's okay. Thanks. So you know, the, 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 in terms of density. You want the smallest object of interest to be visible in the point cloud. So if they say the smallest object of interest in, in, in the heritage building is say five centimeters okay, no. large, then you need half of that. That's the half theory. Go for two centimeters point spacing, which is still uh, in the lower end of uh, laser scanner resolution. So if if you go to high resolution, you get really millimeter point spacing, which is really not useful. Okay. In terms of accuracy, it, it doesn't really matter. All uh, terrestrial laser scanners give you millimeter level accuracy uh, in in one scan. And after you do the registration, depending on how accurate you register your scans together, uh, you can get like a one or two centimeters accurate. That's, that's what we had for the for exhibition building, I think two centimeters. Nice, nice. But, but for the exterior, then it's less accurate. When you use a, a LiDAR on a UAV, for example, then you will have the GPS accuracy and the IMU, and you know, then, then it's less accurate. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was five, six, five centimeters. Uh, for the exterior. Okay, yes, it's, it's fair. Thanks. Jeez. Well, um, <clears throat> actually, um, Shafia is uh, one of our PhD students, uh, new PhD students who's uh, in Indonesia and looking at issues of heritage and being able to, well, um, scan buildings that might not be heritage listed. And uh, Shafia, I, I guess you're either like very um, uh, interested or, or completely terrified by what you've been hearing. So, uh, <laughs> what, 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 do you have any any thoughts or um, uh, or questions? You know, as as to where your research might go. Uh, well, yeah, that's that was a very interesting presentation. Thank you, Kurosh. Uh, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening and try to process everything I've heard. Uh, but in the meantime, I haven't had any question yet. Uh, all of the questions that have been addressed, I, I think it, they're all great questions. <laughs> but, but in the meantime, I, I haven't had any question. Yeah, <laughs> still processing I, I, it and okay, I'm just listening. <laughs> I think so, Sophia yeah. is just terrified <laughs> <laughs> because we are exactly discussing okay, how and what she wants to model and what kind of yeah. details she must have yeah. for the model. Yeah. And she wants oh. to use laser scanning for um, the uh, construction. Pure, yeah. yeah few of oh. her buildings in her uh, city and uh, yeah there are quite a lot of issues related also it, it's cultural heritage it's even not that much um, historical heritage and uh, she tries to identify which components of the buildings are really important from a cultural point of view to be able to model these details in more details so uh, I can imagine that she's now very confused. <laughs> yeah, because there are a lot of uh, tools and technologies that that is offered. So uh, I still need to process which one is the most uh, appropriate for my case. Is it yeah. with a lighter scan or is it with a beam and, or is it like manual? reconstruction so yeah because uh, all of the technologies that you've presented have uh, advantage and also have disadvantage so it really needs to be adjusted to my case mm. yeah, that's and true. probably Kurus, you didn't mention i'm sorry just to i you didn't mention who wanted to have 
um, this model of um, in Melbourne of the building and Excuse for me. what kind of purposes they wanted to use it? Uh, so this is uh, in Melbourne, the heritage buildings are managed by Museums Victoria. Mm. It's the organization. So we had a couple of meetings with them back in 2017. And they said every year we have a document which is um, heritage management plan. And we want to make this digital. Mm. But then, is it the point just to visualize them or they want to have some um, no, no, kind of that's... guiding system where you can explore oh. further something about history of the building, something about the architects and the building stages? What exactly do they have to do? They want to have some kind of web system. Of course, they want because it's in CISU but yeah. uh, where they can query some information and to learn what is what within the model. Yeah, so, you, you know, just like uh, you, you were saying, these different things you can do. When, when we were talking with people in Museums Victoria, the Royal Exhibition Building, uh, and we said you can do this and that, and what do you want it for? They said everything. We want everything. <laughs> and, uh, but the, in, in the end, uh, I think visualization is one of the things they, they really like this 3D visualization of digital data and, and uh, like uh, virtual tools. The other thing is they keep this management plan to, as to, to keep track of the uh, repairs and conservation uh, activities and what's what needs to be done, uh, say, later, for example, if, if they paint a wall, they, they want to keep a record of that. What mm. kind of paint, where did they buy it, how much it cost, you know, all these things. Mm. And yeah, so at least they... they, they... Some, you know, the resources. Yeah. Um, so they wanted all these information in that model. And initially, we because the Royal Exhibition Building is close to the university, and that's where we have our exams, students go there to, to do their exams. We said we create this, we capture some data and, and create a model as a good neighbor. But then we uh, they, we thought that we could continue uh, with them and if they wanted to really develop this uh, in, into a research project, which initially that, that was the idea. Uh, and that stopped at, uh, after some time. Um, I don't know, they, people change, you know, in these organizations, new people come, new interests and new priorities, that they just stopped talking with us. Um, so we were sort of, okay, we, we had, a, I had a student, and I suggested to him that this is a nice project, and hopefully it can lead to something else. So he took up the project, he started developing, and then our conversation with the, people in museums Victoria stopped. Mm. But the student continued the work because he really wants to, you know, get his PhD. Yeah. Yeah, so indeed it's very important what for what kind of purpose you want to create the model. So if you don't have any indications about this is very difficult. I actually see that Jing has her hand uh, up for quite Your some time. Very sore, very sore. That's the uh... Yeah. Thanks, Sissy. Many thanks uh, for your excellent presentation for us. I'm Jean. Um, this is PhD students. Uh, actually, um, my research is try to interpret the human behavior and storm water management and translate into some spatial parametric um, parameters and then to integrate to the urban green space design to facilitate the final de uh, design decision. So today your presentation uh, triggered me some thoughts on the new urban shapes. Actually, in the third part, you mentioned some the later scanning on the road. 
for the driving, uh, uh, sorry, the autonomous uh, vehicle. I think maybe later um, our city will become the driverless city. So I'm thinking if there are some limitation or advantage will um, of the later scanning will change our urban shape. Uh, just like currently, the driver need to, I mean, in the urban design, we should be aware of the crossroad or the uh, corner of the street. Um, we should uh, step back, the, I mean, make the building on the, the plane step back to avoid block the driver's wheel. And uh, also you mentioned the machine learning um, to identify the traffic site. But I'm thinking actually currently the traffic site is set up for the drivers to identify in the next step what exactly the street we are driving on. But uh, if later when we use the driverless, I mean the autonomous vehicle, um, whether we still need this sort of the traffic site because um, they cannot read the, I mean, some tests on the traffic site, or they, we can uh, translate, uh, convert it as a sort of the digital uh, digital sign or some other facilities. So I'm just thinking maybe later our uh, urban layout, city layout of the format will be changed. Um, if there's some, um, that's <laughs> a good point. Maybe in the future with autonomous vehicles. We would need uh, a whole digital city instead of, you know, physical traffic signs, uh, digital representation. You know, the the thing is, when we talk about autonomous vehicle, it's not going to be driverless. It, it, despite everything that you hear in the news, and you know, uh, uh, from Elon Musk uh, talking about autonomous driving and all that, the, there are. Five levels of driving. Self-driving is the level five. It's the ultimate automation where uh, there is even no steering wheel because there is no human in charge of the vehicle, uh, and, and because the human is not allowed to drive the vehicle. But that's too far in the future. If ever it happens, I, I, I don't think it will get there. Um, the Autonomous vehicles that we talk about today, these are level three. So uh, what's, for example, Google Waymo, uh, Baidu Taxi, you know, Ford is developing Tesla. These, these are all level three. And they only, they, they, the, that means, level three means that the vehicle can self-drive, but it would require the human driver to take over any time that is needed. Uh, and if, if when it self drives only in known environments, and known means that there is a map of the road available, which means the human driver is not completely out of the picture. And that means we, we would uh, need the, the traffic signs because if the driver takes over, wants to know what's the speed limit on this road, you know. Um, but you're right, I think it, when in the future, the, we do need an infrastructure for um, these new generation of vehicles, and uh, autonomous driving is only one puzzle, one piece of the puzzle. Uh, you mentioned, for example, intersections. You know, um, the, the, so there is also the connected transport and connected vehicles. The vehicles will have communication devices that they can share information with each other. And the, there will be in, uh, infrastructure. So, uh, in addition to all road signs and you know things that we currently have, there will be sensors also sensing the environment, and these are especially important for vulnerable no road users like pedestrians and cyclists, uh, which might be at risk. So, the idea is that you will monitor the environment with these sensors. For example, a camera or a laser scanner overlooking an intersection and then provides information to the vehicle that's still approaching the intersection. But before approaching, they know what's happening. They know that a pedestrian is crossing the road or a cyclist 
uh, a bicycle is, for example, coming from the other street. So um, even though you don't see it, you don't see the intersection, you don't see behind the corner, you will have information captured by sensors. And that's the idea of connected vehicles. I remember um, somebody was, I think, from um, the MIT Tech Magazine, they, they have a magazine or something, and somebody said the, these connected vehicles can see behind the corners, um, and that, that's what they mean, actually. It, it, because we have an infrastructure of sensors in, in the in future that would allow vehicles to see behind the corners. Thank you. That's a, a, a good um, catchphrase you know, to, to see, see behind the corners. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, re really uh, interesting. You know, when, with all these technologies, you were talking about sight lines. And so to be able to build up a, you know, predictive database, yeah, gee, there's a lot of research to be done. And it's very, um, yeah, very, very, very uh, rich area, I think. So, uh, Actually, I, I interrupted, I believe, Abdu. Abdu, you wanted to say something at a certain moment and I jumped over you. So, sorry, Abdu. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, it was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember yeah, it just was, now that it was a long you time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I remember, of course. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kurash. It was a really, really nice talk. It was at, at the time of the... the, hash, uh, the um, heritage beam and i found it very interesting actually the this perspective that you guys are working from which is not necessarily blending the things but uh, uh putting them in layers and um and i was i just wanted to add when cc was asking about the, the detail needed for beam i think indeed uh, with this kind of approach the even if the beam is not that precise it's fine because if it carries the semantic and uh, you somehow you, you use it for the semantic and then you use the rest for the visualization or the measurement, etc. And uh, basically every model will uh, kind of uh, um, uh, mitigate the, the limitation of the other one. And in, even when Jack was uh, asking, I think about, for example, if you take the dome, even if you represent a very simplified dome, it's still fine when you click on it you get the semantic information but when if you want to visualize it uh, then you can look at the point cloud now what i wanted to ask was to if it is enough just to have them as layer or between the layers some minimum communication is required for example the dome will we need to segment the point cloud uh, so that so as to even if you have one simplified dome in the beam at least it matches some points of the point cloud, and you know, so if you click on something, you can isolate something specific. Yeah, you don't need that. Uh, and uh, so that registration between the layers facilitate this interaction. And this is one of the things that Marco implemented as, as one of the functionalities of his platform, is uh, you can uh, select a beam element, for example, the dome, and then mm -hmm you can easily cut around the point cloud uh, based on, so if you want to do, for example, automatic segmentation, you will run into a lot of problems, you know, with segmentation of point yeah. clouds not really working well. But this is a very easy trick. You, you select the dome in the beam and it just creates a buffer and cuts the point cloud yeah. or, or mesh. The bounding box, yeah. We actually found that for mesh is more complicated, but point cloud is pretty easy. Uh, so yeah, yes, so the, Inter interaction is uh, very useful. Yeah, so that's that's why I mean I, that was my point back then. I I really like this this approach because it sounds very easy, uh, but it's very practical. And uh, then we, there is a lot of headaches that <laughs> need to be addressed because we can worry about scan to beam, but in in practice most of the applications that require scan to beam don't need that level of detail of beam unless it is asset management and still asset management if it is just for the visual aspect the point cloud is enough for the information aspect they have spreadsheets 
So yeah, so basically the the the, the, the I mean, what I want to say is the fact of trying to have this beam, which is as realistic as possible, may not even be that useful. So that's just what yeah, I'm visual viewing currently. That's right. I, I agree. I think, but but there are still lots of things that uh, we can still develop. There are still challenges. For example, with the beam. One of the things you can do is have a temporal dimension. You basically have a 4D beam that shows the changes of the building. You basically document any stage of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so if, if you want to then bring that to, to this integrated model, then you need a way to update your mesh data or, or point cloud data. Or if, if you just want to keep these models at different times, then you, you also need to keep their, you know, in, integration. Yeah. So these that's, are other issues that yeah, still. That's true, but probably probably some mechanism of sublayering could help because if for every layer, the beam layer, you have some sublayer which is related to time, then yeah, because the big mechanism will not change. Will unchange. And, uh, and I think you can still implement because we have some similar issue when we discuss indoor GML, uh, different layer representing different spaces, etc., and even sometimes different time. And uh, as if you want, if you can go with layer, I think it's you can do a lot of stuff. So, uh, sorry, my network is not that great, but uh, I hope that that's what I wanted to say CC, uh, earlier. But this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, Thank very you. interesting discussion. Yeah, so a uh, really long discussion. Very nice. Uh, thanks, Kurush, for uh, yeah, staying so long with us. Jack, back to you. <laughs> yeah, no, really, really, we could, we could, well, we could build our careers out of the rest of the this, this discussion. You know, it's a lot of a lot of things to talk about and a huge area of, of research. You know, that's uh, really you know, spans the globe, if not other planets. So, um, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Kurosh. You're um, you, you. We're coming up to. Uh, we're over two hours, which is probably maybe our longest presentation. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's so, um, so yeah, so thank you everyone else for joining us, and um, yeah, uh, this will be uh, put on our YouTube channel. So uh, please like thank and subscribe, you. and um, and uh, turn your mics off for a round of applause for Kurosh. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess you mean mic on. Thank you all. I I hope uh, it was useful. Very and, uh, enjoyed. Yeah, lots of work to be done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll stop recording right now. Okay. And we can.